Phyllis Hyman's life began in the city of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania on July 6, 1949, but it was in Pittsburgh where her roots truly took hold. As the oldest of seven siblings, she carried the weight of responsibility early on, a trait that would later define her resilient spirit. What makes her story even more intriguing is her connection to the world of entertainment. Phyllis was the cousin of Earl Hyman, the esteemed actor best known for his role on The Cosby Show. The creative genes ran deep in their family, and she was destined to leave her mark. In the hallways of high school, she discovered her true passion for singing. Joining the choir was the first step, but it was the guidance of a dedicated music teacher that ignited her spark. Under his mentorship, she learned how to stay in key, mastered the delicate art of breathing, and dove into advanced vocal techniques. Upon graduation, Phyllis's talent earned her the distinction of being awarded the very first music scholarship to Robert Morris, a small university in a suburb of Pittsburgh. The future seemed bright, but it was clear that her heart belonged on stage. With unhesitant determination, she dropped out of school, setting her sights on a singing career. She formed various bands, seeking that perfect collaboration that would define her success. Though her early attempts were met with setbacks, her spirit remained unbroken. Phyllis moved to Miami in the early 70s, hoping that the change of scenery would be the catalyst she needed. She began performing in nightclubs along South Beach. She then took a job on a cruise ship based in the Miami area. On this voyage, she crossed paths with a man named Larry Alexander. Little did she know that this chance encounter would evolve into a profound partnership both in business and in life, as Larry later became her beloved husband. Following her memorable stint on the ship, she formed a group that she named the Phyllis Hyman Factor. Taking her rightful place as the lead singer, the band played at small venues, leaving audiences mesmerized in their wake. In 1974, Phyllis's talent transcended beyond live performances as she made her silver screen debut in the movie Lenny that also starred Dustin Hoffman. This was just a taste of the spotlight that was about to shine even brighter on her as she also cut her first record, leaving the good life behind. She moved to New York in 1975, for it was in the Big Apple that dreams were known to be woven into reality. She caught the attention of Norman Connors, a maestro known for noticing incredible vocalists. He extended an invitation for her to lend her voice to his album, You Are My Starship, released under the Buddha record label, and it was her rendition of the stylistics classic Betcha by Golly Wow that set radios ablaze. In 1977, Buddha Records offered her a solo deal. Her self-titled debut album featured tracks like Loving You, Losing You, and No One Can Love You More. These songs became the cornerstone of a new radio format called The Quiet Storm, where ballads played late into the night, soothing souls and igniting passions. Remarkably, during that same year, she also sang the lyrics to a Burger King commercial. We broil 800 million burgers a year, fresh and hot, one at a time. Get it right, America. Get it right at Burger King. Phyllis's journey through the music industry was a roller coaster of highs and lows, triumphs and challenges. She unveiled her second album, Sing a Song, in 1978. Unfortunately, this release didn't make much of a splash on the charts, leaving her eager for a hit. Arista Records, under the visionary leadership of Clive Davis, took over the distribution of Buddha Records where Phyllis was signed. This transition brought a fresh wave of opportunities, with Davis himself recruiting the iconic Barry Manilow to collaborate with Phyllis on her third album. While it didn't quite reach the heights Clive had hoped for, it marked a significant step in Phyllis's career. In 1980, Clive pulled out all the stops, enlisting the talents of James and Tume and Reggie Lucas to produce her next album. The title track, You Know How to Love Me, ignited a buzz across the airwaves. However, success came at a price. She found herself at odds with Clive Davis over the direction of her music. He favored a more pop-oriented sound, while she yearned to delve into soulful ballads, creating a tension between them that would persist. In the midst of these professional challenges, Phyllis faced personal turmoil as her marriage began to unravel. Surrounded by mounting problems in both her love life and her career, she turned to cocaine to ease her troubled mind. In 1981, 
her fifth album resonated deeply with her ever-growing audience. Moreover, Phyllis was not content with merely conquering the music scene. Her ambition knew no bounds as she graced the grand stages of Broadway, stepping into the spotlight of the musical Sophisticated Ladies. Consequently, the relentless 22-month schedule of performances, combined with recording commitments and the demands of promoting her latest album, cast a long shadow. The weight of it all burdened her, leading to increased drug use as a means of coping. In the company of her relatives and close friends, Phyllis's demeanor began to shift. Irritability and mood swings became all too familiar, and tensions with Arista Records escalated to a breaking point, forcing her into a hiatus from her recording career. In 1983, she returned with her sixth album, Goddess of Love. Be that as it may, the promotion fell short of what a talent like hers deserved. Rumors swirled that Clive Davis had shifted his focus toward a rising star named Whitney Houston. By 1985, her journey with Arista had run its course, and although she was dropped from the label, Phyllis's legacy in music was far from over. A new chapter began when she signed with Kenny Gamble and Leon Huff, the powerhouses behind Philadelphia International Records. This renowned label had nurtured the careers of legendary artists like Teddy Pendergrass, Patti LaBelle, and Lou Rawls. In 1986, she secured an apartment in Philadelphia, aiming for convenient access to the recording studio, and subsequently released her seventh album. The first single, Old Friend, captured the hearts of her listeners. But behind the scenes, her life painted a different picture. The album's second single, Living All Alone, featured an impressive whistling by Phyllis, a unique touch that concealed the turmoil within. Feeling alone and grappling with her recent divorce, she battled bouts of depression, making it difficult to face the world each day. Her mood swings grew more unpredictable, her patience waned, and her focus wavered. After being convinced by loved ones to enter therapy, she was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. In an effort to manage her condition, she was given a series of prescribed medications. However, the side effects which included dizziness and nausea pushed her to disregard their use. As she leaned on drugs and alcohol for solace, she found herself in rehab. Emerging from treatment, she was revitalized, happy, and more pleasant to be around. Nevertheless, this renewal would prove to be temporary. As the 80s drew to a close, Phyllis made appearances in a handful of films. Still, even as she explored new horizons, her addiction resurfaced. How in the hell did you get in here? Chicks of the train. Listen, I've got $100. It's in my purse. Just get it and get, just get out. In 1990, she took an overdose of sleeping pills in her Philadelphia apartment, a distressing incident that foretold the challenges yet to come. In 1991, she entered rehab once again with a resolute determination to conquer her mental health challenges. Months later, when she was released from the facility, she consumed her first alcoholic drink in less than 24 hours. She delivered her first album in five years, marking a pivotal moment. The singles Don't Want to Change the World, Living in Confusion, and Meet Me on the Moon soared on the charts, a triumph that was celebrated with gold certification. As 1993 unfolded, so did a series of hardships. She bid farewell to both her mother and grandmother within a month of one another, and in 1994, a broken foot necessitated a lengthy recovery. Compounded by her spending habits, financial troubles shrouded her future in uncertainty. During this time of despair, food, drugs, and alcohol provided a refuge from the overwhelming sadness that seemed to envelop her as she lay in bed. On the night of June 30, 1995, Phyllis was scheduled to perform at New York's Apollo Theater. Earlier that day, she had given instructions to her assistants to ensure her punctuality for the afternoon sound check. Alarmingly, when they reached her apartment, there was no answer at the door. After opening it with force, Phyllis was found unconscious. She was immediately rushed to Roosevelt Hospital, but tragically she slipped away two hours later. Tonight at the apparent suicide of popular jazz singer Phyllis Hyman. The 45-year-old Hyman was supposed to sing at the Apollo Theater tonight, but her assistant found her unconscious in her midtown apartment this afternoon. She died at a nearby hospital. Police say pill bottles and notes were found near Hyman's body. 
Jazz singer Phyllis Hyman dead of an apparent suicide at age 45. It was a heartbreaking end to a life that had weathered countless storms. She left behind a suicide note that bore the weight of her struggles. Phyllis Hyman was just 45 years old and would have been 46 less than a week later. Her birthdays were milestones that had often left her feeling unfulfilled. Her devastating departure left a legacy that continues to captivate and inspire. Philadelphia International Records posthumously released I Refuse to Be Lonely, an album that revealed her innermost feelings, shedding light on the delicate issue of mental health.